From the station working for you, this is WRTV News at 5.30, streaming now. Now at 5.30, transparency. That is the motive behind IMPD releasing this video of a police-involved shooting. What the chief has to tell us. Also still ahead, appliance shortage. Why refrigerators, dishwashers, and freezers are still in short supply and what you can do if you need one. Topping our lineup, some colleges are doing regular COVID testing to get students back on campus. We're getting answers if getting a vaccine could be a requirement next. Well, the pandemic is changing our faith traditions this holiday season. How some are finding non-traditional ways to still keep them alive. And there are rules you may not know about when it comes to paying too much for prescription glasses and contacts. Well, you need to know about your prescription to get the best deal. Just after 5.30 on this dry Tuesday evening, waiting, I don't know if we're waiting patiently or not, for some snow that will arrive overnight. The gray of the cloud cover pierced at times by some thin spots, so you at least get uh, the hint of some sunshine. And the sun is set, obviously, but we got a little bit this afternoon. 31 in Martinsville, 31 in Edinburgh. Temperatures uh, tonight will drop into the 20s, and we're not alone. Look at the colder air back to the west, and it sinks to the deep south, too. The snow in Missouri, Oklahoma, and Kansas now. It should move across the Wabash and Ohio rivers as we get past midnight, pushing into southern Indiana first and then lifting north. Ballpark timeline 4 to about 6 or 7 a.m., arriving in the metro area with temperatures below freezing. Again, any of the untreated roads we'll see the accumulation start temperatures right at freezing come above freezing by noon that'll help on the roadways especially at that point as we've been salted and treated we start to make some progress afternoon high 35 degrees again looking at one to two inch snowfall potential amanda New at 5.30, Metro Police have just released video showing the moment an officer shot a man outside of a Westside sports bar. WRTV is showing you parts of that video. The incident happened on November 14th during an argument outside of El Chila sports bar on West 34th Street. A man IMPD identified as 19-year-old Luis Suarez is seen in the video pointing a gun at a group of people outside of the bar. A responding officer shot Suarez and then there was a foot chase. The video also shows officers catching him and providing first aid before medics arrived. Suarez survived. WRTV spoke with IMPD Chief Randall Taylor about the reason the department is releasing this video. From the beginning, I've, I've told people, the, the community, that uh, I wanted IMPD to be as transparent as possible. Uh, with the body advent of the body cameras, I think it allows us to uh, let the community see uh, what their department is doing, how we're handling different situations. You don't want our officers to have to shoot. You don't want people to do things that, that, that cause officers to shoot. But if that happened and since that happened, the best that we could hope for is that we got that wrapped up pretty quick and, and no one was seriously injured. Now, this is the second video of its kind released recently by the department. To see the full video, go to the story in your WRTV app. Chief Taylor says they are open to the public for suggestions as to how these videos are released. The department is looking into captioning or narration in other languages for city residents who do not speak English. Chris. The FDA's analysis is out on the second COVID-19 vaccine. It will consider for emergency approval this week. It is Moderna's candidate. Now, there are no concerns that would prevent authorization. Side effects were minor, very similar to Pfizer's vaccine. Its effectiveness varies a little more depending on the person's age, and it is still considered highly effective. Moderna says it can prevent asymptomatic spread, which is something that we're still not sure that Pfizer's can do. Now, meanwhile, the FDA said there were four cases of Bell's palsy reported among Moderna's trial participants. Three got the vaccine, one got the placebo. Our working hypothesis is this just was an imbalance in background rates like we've seen in other trials, but we'll make sure that we're going to actually query for that. The government says Bell's palsy, which is a temporary weakness on one half of the face, may not necessarily be a side effect. The amount of participants who got it were consistent with the expected background rate for this condition among the general population. The FDA and CDC will be watching for it and nearly two dozen other conditions in all vaccine recipients. I think having this conversation about those background events 
Um, I mean, vaccines are going to be given to people who are in long-term care facilities. Right. And, and we know things happen, medical events happen to those individuals as well. The government did point to one example out of South Korea where the numbers showed a higher death rate in older people who received the flu vaccine. The reality was the death rate was higher because they were vaccinating more people. It wasn't causing more deaths. Now, when it comes to the COVID vaccine, health leaders say the health benefits go beyond the virus because overall death rates are higher to people putting off routine medical care. New data on the Pfizer vaccine also shows it can block 19 versions of the virus. That means protection against mutation. The CDC is clearing up confusion over why nursing homes were not part of the initial COVID vaccinations yesterday. The agency says the vast majority will start vaccinating staff and residents on December 21st. That's when a federal program that uses pharmacy chains launches and most facilities opted to take part in it. CDC says more than 1,100 vaccination clinics will be happening at nursing homes that day. All right, ahead in our lineup, some colleges are doing regular COVID testing to get students back on campus. We're getting answers if getting a vaccine could be a requirement. If you have been looking for a new kitchen appliance this year, you probably know they can be as tough as finding a new Xbox or PlayStation. Consumer reporter John Matteris has tips for finding that new fridge or freezer so you don't waste your money. Looking for a new fridge, dishwasher, or range? Well, the appliance shortage has started way back in March. Shows no sign of letting up. Tommy Conagher needs more space in his fridge. Yeah, this is one we've had when we built the house 17 years ago. Like many families this pandemic, he tells me he wants to stock up on frozen beef and chicken. Well, we'll just invest in a freezer that we'll put in the garage. So we started to look. But finding a freezer was tougher than finding Nemo. And so we've been searching all summer long, really, for almost nine months now. And even when uh, the big box stores have their specials, they don't have them in stock. It turns out it doesn't matter whether you're looking for a freezer or a refrigerator, an $800 model or an $8,000 model. You're going to find shortages just about everywhere. So this cafe brand is uh, quite hard to come by at the moment. Ken Riemann is co-owner of an appliance distributor who supplies builders and remodelers. And when I check on our vendor websites, they're just not available. He says the shortages that started when factories shut down for two months have not let up. They'll give, for instance, an estimated time of December 5th and December 6th comes around and that date moves then to January. The issue now is high demand as people spend their vacation dollars this year on their kitchens. His suggestion, be flexible on brand and model. But what do you tell someone who says, I need a refrigerator now? We have products coming in. Our warehouses are more stuffed now than they have been ever, but it seems that we can't get the full package. If your heart is set on an exact size, color, and model, he says you could wait till spring. The worst shortage of all, standalone freezers because not many of them are made. So as don't waste your money. I'm John Matteris, WRTV. Colleges and universities are looking ahead to the spring semester as the pandemic continues. Universities like Georgetown, Smith College in Massachusetts, Princeton, and the University of Florida are either inviting undergrads to live on campus starting in January or bringing back more students for face-to-face -face learning. Schools like Princeton and Florida will test students and staff regularly. University of Florida already has students living on campus and has more than 14,000 undergrads registered to take in-person classes in the spring. We feel it's important to move the campus back to, to normalcy to the extent possible because in the end a, a university is really a community of people uh, living and working and researching together and we feel it's important to begin to bring people back and reestablish that sense of community. While having 14,000 undergrads on campus sounds like a large number, this is less than half of the 36,000 undergrads who are enrolled at the university. The campus has reduced class sizes and is already near capacity of what they can handle while being socially distanced. Now, before the pandemic, many states required college students to have the bacterial meningitis vaccine if they want to live on campus. Now, that still stands, but now there's a possibility that universities could have a similar requirement for the COVID vaccine until it moves from emergency use to a more normal permanent approval uh, that that will that will probably remain in the realm of possibility but but only theoretical possibility ultimately it is up to states to decide whether this should be a requirement the earliest states could decide on this 
Well, it's likely about six months from now. All right, next in our pandemic, uh, next in our lineup, the pandemic is changing our faith traditions this holiday season. How some are finding non-traditional ways to still keep them alive. Scientists are harnessing a not so secret weapon in the fight against climate change, plants. But they're genetically engineering the plants to help them do their job better. Researchers tell Amanda Brandeis if successful, this initiative could help save the planet from global warming. Sometimes the answers to our biggest problems. The climate crisis is enormous. Are simpler than we think. Plants are very good at one thing, and that is to catch carbon dioxide out of the air and using the power of the sunlight to fix it, to make into biomaterials. Protecting the planet. Plants are superheroes. Is rooted in their DNA. They can do what nothing else can do, no technical solution at that scale to catch a lot of carbon dioxide and fix it. And yet humanity is still losing the climate change battle. After decades of burning fossil fuels, the planet continues to warm, with natural disasters growing more frequent and intense. I think we need all hands on deck. While plants suck up carbon dioxide, they then release some of it back in the atmosphere. How can we actually make plants better in not only catching the carbon dioxide, but keeping it in the soil? The answer could be inside this greenhouse. Co-director of the Salk Institute's Harnessing Plants Initiative, Wolfgang Bush and his team are identifying genes that help plants store more carbon. We are trying to enhance their superhero capability even more. They're developing plants with deeper, more massive roots, rich in a substance called subarin, a natural carbon storage device. And so we think it has all the characteristics of, of something that can make a huge impact addressing this very difficult question how to draw down carbon dioxide from the air and store it. These climate fighting traits can then be transferred to the world's most prevalent crops, like corn and wheat, converting more than 75% of the world's cropland into carbon storage. So we think then in 10 to 15 years, after partnering with different stakeholders, seeds will be available to farmers at scale to plant the first carbon sequestering crops. He says storing carbon underground not only protects the atmosphere, but enriches the soil. And the enhanced root systems protect plants from climate threats like drought. It gives us hope that we can make a, a huge impact. I'm Amanda Brandeis reporting. Amanda, thank you. Now, the initiative has received more than $65 million in grants. The most recent boost comes from Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos donating $30 million. City lights taking over on this cloudy, dry evening after midnight is when we expect some light snow first in southern Indiana. Then that will push to the north, probably arrive in the metro area after 4 a.m. 31 is the temperature, that east wind at 14, visibility not an issue at times tomorrow in the snow, visibility be a mile, maybe a little less. Temperatures all across the state, below average for this time of the year. It's 28 in Peru, Fort Wayne's in the 20s, Gary 30 degrees, warmer down along the Ohio River. For the evening hours, very little temperature change. What will change gradually will add a little moisture to the atmosphere, kind of prime things for the arrival of the snow after midnight and tomorrow. Again, light snow is the way I would characterize this. One to possibly two inches of accumulation. We wake up, there's your light snow in progress. And I think through the day tomorrow, periods of light snow may mix with a little light rain in the afternoon. Then by tomorrow evening, that will be moving out. We'll talk about what moves in for Thursday, Friday, and the weekend coming up. Chris? Since the start of this pandemic, people have been rushing to buy a small medical device. It's called a pulse oximeter. Now, it measures the level of oxygen in the blood, but doctors say not everyone needs to use the device. If you are a patient who has a chronic lung condition and need to check oxygen uh, saturation on a regular basis because you are susceptible to requiring oxygen or patients who go in the hospital frequently for lung conditions, um, then you should have a pulse oximeter. Now, people with COVID-19 or pneumonia who have been told to stay home may want to use this device, but before doing so, it's best to ask your doctor. 
Bad headlights have been reported as a safety concern on cars, but now car makers are making significant improvements. According to the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, headlights were improved on 17 vehicles they tested. That includes models by Honda, Hyundai, Nissan, Subaru, and Volvo. The IIHS says before headlights were often installed in a way that were aimed at oncoming drivers and not on the road. This year, Walmart and Salvation Army are taking their red kettle campaign online. Customers who shop on Walmart's website and its app can round up their total to the nearest dollar and that leftover change will go to the Salvation Army. Customers can also buy gifts for children in the Salvation Army's Angel Tree program. You can do this at SalvationArmyUSA.org. Many churches have put holiday traditions on hold this year, but Ashley Sampson found that people are finding creative ways to keep the spirit of the season alive. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. From every clime. Well, kind of. Cities across the U.S. still may be trying to deck the halls, but a COVID Christmas just looks and feels different. Just everything is closed down. For people of faith, a season full of worship and togetherness will be missed. They do feel isolated. Glenroy Watson is a bishop over a congregation of about 100 families. We'd eat dinner, we'd hang out, we'd have like a presentation, a Christmas presentation. This year, religious celebrations will need to be held at home, but he had an idea. Just hoping that everyone will, one, learn a little bit more about each and our, our one another, and then two, just to continue to feel united. He's asked all families in his congregation to make a home video about their traditions or fond holiday memories to share with each other. It'll be a, a kind of like a little mini movie, so to say. <laughs> First, the Cordero family, where Christmas jammies are a must. So for our Christmas tradition, what we do is we read the story about Jesus Christ. That is an angel. That's an angel, I know. But the wise men saw the star, oh. right? Church piano player Verlin Brink, playing Christmas hymns for everyone is something she will miss most. I had one of my favorite memories of, of Christmas in France. You as a boy, as an Tonight, she plays for an audience of one. She's looking forward to the virtual viewing party in the days ahead. All right, you guys ready? We're the Maguires. With this year being a little bit different, um, we have started some new traditions. Including a little communication with the North Pole for the kids. You, I'm Maria Acapella, and I lead the North Pole Chorus. <laughs> this family says they miss meeting with their church family more than ever. Especially during this year when I think a lot of people have struggled with different things and there hasn't been a lot to feel very hopeful about. They hope the family video they're making will brighten another's day. That's everything from us. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. As the videos come pouring in to Glenroy Watson, it's his family's turn. We're the Watson family and... <laughs> okay, start over. Okay, let's try that again. The shiny star. I like the shiny star. So even if these families' Christmas celebrations will take place on a living room couch instead of a church pew. Every day we're adding some hay in there. The message is the same. We care about each other, we remember each other, and we love one another. I'm Ashley Sampson reporting. A great message there, Ashley. Thank you. Now, finally in our lineup, there are rules you may not know about to keep you from paying too much for prescription glasses and contacts. What you need to know about your prescription, make sure you get the best deal. The Federal Trade Commission is now cracking down on glasses and contact prescribers who might try to stop you from shopping around. FTC sent warning letters to almost 30 different eyeglass prescribers. These letters say that they must give you a copy of the prescription and you shouldn't have to ask for it. They can't charge you a special fee for doing that either. And they can't force you to buy from them just because they did the exam. However, there were a lot of prescribers that just weren't doing that. Uh, they, if you asked for it, in most cases you would get it. They also are required to post um, notices in the offices to say that you have a right to your prescription. And a lot of uh, prescribers were not posting those notices. Consumer Action is educating people on their eyeglass and contacts prescription rights. Linda Sherry says that prescription allows you to go online and to other eyeglass and contact sellers to shop for the best deal. Another thing she says to ask for, especially if you're shopping online, is pupil distance. 
and it may not be on the prescription. I had an experience where I asked for the pupil distance and was told that would be $25 to put the pupil distance on. So I was like, I've been coming here for three years and you've obviously measured my pupil distance because I bought glasses from you. So all you have to do is open your records and tell me my pupil distance. And they did do it. But there was that moment there when she said $25 for the pupil distance measurement when I thought, oh, something's very, very wrong here. Prescribers should not be charging for that info either. And if you're having trouble getting prescription information from your provider, you can contact the Federal Trade Commission. But remember, you may also be due for a new eye exam. State laws vary, but most eye prescriptions are only good for one year. Finance experts say many unemployed people don't know about government programs that are available to help. In many cases, people have never faced the hardships they are now. Tomorrow, We'll run down three programs and hear why experts say the time to apply is right now. Warming trend in the forecast will be slow, gradual, but noticeable. We'll make it into the 40s by the weekend with even warmer temperatures next week. But I know that's not what's on your mind. You want to hear about tomorrow's snow potential. That comes up right now. The news starts 